It's about time you showed up, Fox. You're the only hope for our world. I'll do my best. Andros won't have his way with me. Good luck. Nintendo has a knack for creating some of the most creative and groundbreaking franchises out there. They also have a knack for putting said franchises six feet under. Despite what their net worth might tell you, Nintendo has limited development resources and simply can't continuously support all their IPs. If there isn't a new Zelda game announced every other month, the fans will get antsy. So there's often a pretty clear line drawn between Nintendo's active and dead franchises. Even if some don't get the most frequent releases, you can often tell which series are still on Nintendo's mind. They're getting more games eventually, you just have to wait. A really long time. Star Fox, however, seems to live in its own Nintendo purgatory. Not quite dead, but definitely in the process of pre-ordering a tombstone. The series has still sporadically appeared over the past few decades, with new games and cameos, but it never really feels like they're actively looking to move the series forward. And that's because, for the most part, they aren't. Since Star Fox 64, most titles in the series have either been very experimental, garnering mixed reception, or just trying to be Star Fox 64 again, a game that was already a reimagining of the first Star Fox. What we're ultimately left with is a messy franchise heavily centered around a game that came out over 20 years ago. So, I'm curious, did Star Fox really peak in high school? Or is Nintendo trying to recapture something that was never really there? Only one way to know for sure. As I mentioned before, this game is essentially a remake of the original Star Fox on the Super Nintendo. The original was a huge technical showcase for its time, but nowadays it looks like paper airplanes flying in an abandoned hellscape, so the facelift definitely goes a long way into immersing you in this world. The evil floating monkey head Andros is trying to take over the galaxy, so we at Star Fox are recruited by General Pepper of the Cornerian Army to fight their war for them. The team consists of Fox McCloud, Falco Lombardi, Slippy Toad, Peppy Hair, and their new part-timer, me. Now, without further ado, let's rock and roll! Our team will need to travel across the entire Lilat system to stop Andros and his forces. Each planet along the way will contain its own mission consisting of on-rail shooting or free-range dogfighting. A majority of the missions stick to the on-rails element, but some end up incorporating both. Each mission will send an onslaught of enemies for you to mow down, or just avoid. Seriously, you can just leave these guys to destroy the city if you want. You might get paid less though. Your reticle will follow your R-Wing's movements, with just a little wiggle room for more precision shots. A little clunky at times, but overall works well enough. A bit of gyro controls would probably work really well for a game like this. A bit of gyro controls. Along with standard shots, the R-Wing is capable of charge shots, lock-on, and bombs. The rest of Team Star Fox will be there to assist you. And by assist, I mean... Whoa! Help me! They're on me! I'm getting careless! I can't take this guy! Oh no! Stop! Stop and cry! Stop it, you can help me, Fox! They're really only here in spirit. And their spirits are pretty annoying at times. I guess I should be thankful. Wow. You are an ass. So, we're primarily on our own here, and saving our teammates is really up to our own discretion. At very least, Peppy gives us some instructions on piloting the R-Wing. We can brake, speed up, turn 90 degrees, do somersaults, U-turns, and of course... Do a barrel roll! There's even a first-person view if you want to feel nauseous. These moves will be essential to maneuvering your way through the environment and keeping your damage to a minimum. If you do end up taking serious hits, you'll want to collect rings to refill or expand your health. In moments of crisis, Star Fox's robotic assistant, Rob64, will send you helpful items that will allow you to persevere. This is why he's S-tier. Each mission concludes with a boss fight against one of Andros's pawns. They'll usually just taunt you as you shoot their obvious weak points. However, some of them can be fairly spongy and just all around brutal if you don't know what you're doing. Let me handle this! Slippy, get back here! So, I hear you have a full-time opening now. So, this is probably a good time to bring up the game's mortality system. After each mission, you'll get a report on all your teammates regarding their R-Wing's condition and their ability to fight. If a team member is taken down in one mission, they'll be unavailable for the next while their ship gets repaired. Health will also carry over level to level, so it's almost inevitable that each team member will be missing in action at some point. Falco's ship is in the docking bay. Peppy's ship is in the docking bay. 
Reese's Arwen crashed and he was killed on impact. To rescue Slippy from Titania, we'll need to utilize one of our alternate vehicles, the Landmaster. This Master of Land controls similarly to the R-Wing, but is suspended to the ground with the exception of a hover move. The lack of vertical movement makes aiming with the Landmaster feel really imprecise. The best sections of these levels are when you're speeding past enemies or hovering over hazards, rather than shooting. Even from ground level, the team expects me to take out all the aerial threats. Once Slippy's been saved and demoted, it's time for some All Range Mode! In these sections, we'll have full 360 control of our R-Wing, and I'll be honest, I don't really like it. The R-Wing controls best when you're flying in a straight line or making slight turns. When you deviate from these mechanics, things get overly tedious and tiring. When you inevitably reach the edge of the arena, your choices will be to turn at a snail's pace or activate a 3 second cutscene where you lose control of your R-Wing for a good 40 feet. Repeat this cycle of circling for around 5 minutes and you may or may not have accomplished your mission. Finally got it. Fuck, that's one of ours! The scenarios for these levels are also so mundane in comparison to the on-rail ones. Sure, on-rail levels don't give you the same level of freedom, but having everything scripted allows for the levels to include much more dynamic locations and engaging events. Almost every all-range section boils down to shooting at enemies randomly scattered in an open field. <laughs> Looks like you guys got things covered around here, so I'm probably gonna go hit up a Taco Bell. Can't let you do that, Star Fox. Oh, sh so, on select missions, you'll run into Star Fox's edgy counterpart, Star Wolf, and will proceed to battle in an all-out dogfight. All the issues I have with all-range mode are obviously still present here, with the added bonus of smarter and more annoying AI. Each team will be chasing the other's tails, and you'll need to make good use of somersaults to gain the upper hand. Trying to catch these guys in your crosshairs is very tedious, especially on later stages when they are much faster than you. Your best shot for taking them down is to shoot at the ones chasing your disposable teammates. If your teammates are out of commission, however, you're probably going to be dogpiled to the game over screen. Once you have wolf blood on your hands, it's time to bring the fight directly to Andros himself on Venom. After a few final waves of enemies and a mini boss, we're right outside his lair. I'll go it alone from here. Oh yeah, sure, going alone. It's only the most powerful being in the universe. So, to defeat this abomination ape, Fox will need to shoot the glowy spots on his hands. I clearly missed biology that day. Once his hands are gone, you just shoot his face until it melts, revealing his robot interior. I have so many questions. Once you've shot enough lasers into his face, he and his base will begin to self-destruct. Cue the Death Star escape sequence, and credits. Quite the adventure for my first day. I wonder how many hours I've been on the clock. One hour?! This game is a fairly short endeavor, with the main campaign only running about an hour, if not shorter. And that's entirely by design, as the developers wanted players to beat the game in one sitting. Hence no saves, and the emphasis on scores and the leaderboard. In one playthrough, you've only seen a fraction of what this game has to offer. Every playthrough will consist of seven missions, starting at Corneria and ending at Venom. But how you get there can differ drastically from run to run. Certain levels contain special objectives that when met can open up alternative routes with new missions on new planets. On the map, these routes are assigned a color indicating their difficulty, with blue being the beginner route, yellow being the veteran route, and red being the expert route. Reaching some of these courses can be extremely difficult, because if you fail an objective anywhere along the way, you'll be sent down to a lower route, which is especially troubling when the game doesn't explicitly tell you the objective. These alternative routes contain some of the most unique content in the game. On Planet Solar, your health will always be draining, and you'll need to be constantly collecting rings just to survive. Planet Macbeth brings back the Landmaster in a chase against a weapons train. The boss of Planet Zonus requires you to barrage their submarine relentlessly with bombs. And probably the most surprising, Planet Aquas Ocean has us piloting the Blue Marine, a vehicle exclusive to this level. I'd never even heard about this, and that says a lot. Random Nintendo knowledge is my major. The sub itself just controls like a slower R-Wing, equipped with infinite torpedoes instead of bombs. Pretty good trade-off. Since you're deep underwater, everything is nearly pitch black, so you'll need to use torpedoes to light your path. 
I've never liked the gimmick of heavily obscuring the player's view. If I wanted to go to a dark place, I'd leave myself alone with my thoughts. However, the 5% of the level I can see is really cool, and the boss at the end is so quirky and weird, so I'll have to give it a pass. Thanks, Flip. Blue Marine came through. Flip is not such a screw up after all. Thanks a lot, Peppy. And what better way to follow all that up than with more all range mode levels? Yay! Now all that's left is to beat Andros again. Entering Venom on the easy route led to one of the best missions in the game, so who knows what we might see on the expert route. Don't get too cocky, Star Fox. This is by far the most difficult mission section in the whole game. Star Wolf is just too fast, their attacks do so much damage, and as usual, my team is just worthless. This section brought me to the good old game over screen. Shouldn't be too bad, I'll probably just be sent back to the beginning of the level. <laughs> if you get a game over, your game is over in the most literal sense of the word. You'll have to start all the way back at Corneria. Now as I've said, this is a short game, so you're not losing your life's work or anything. But getting a game over in the late game is such a downer on your experience. Something as simple as a save point halfway through would have gone a long way. So I played through it all again, this time using save states, <coughs> I mean skill, to dispose of Star Wolf once and for all. Andros is now all that stands between me and putting in my two week notice. Just need to crush this robotic chimp one last... Oh my god. So, taking the expert route lets us fight the actual Andros. Turns out that robot was just a decoy. Oh, thank god. This is Andros's true form. Sh the final phase of this fight involves shooting down his eyes and brain in all range mode. His brain chases you down, so it's extremely difficult to get the space you need to turn around and shoot. And if you get caught by his brain, you're likely a goner. Don't know whose brain rotted first in that fight, but he's finally dead. While our escape was originally a cutscene, now we have to pilot our way out of Venom. And who better to help us out than Fox's dead father? Never give up. Trust your instincts. Alright, uh, this way. Eventually, we escape with just slightly more family trauma. And with that, the Lilat Wars are finally over. Well, it's about time. So, now that we're finally done with the campaign, all that's left is the extra modes, like training. You sure do train. Last but not least, we have Versus, which comes with three different competitive modes, Point Match, Battle Royale, and Time Trial. All three modes take place in all range mode, which, not to sound like a broken record, but... <laughs> However, the chaotic nature of all range mode lends itself much better to multiplayer, where I can scream at my friends and not a screen. In point matches, players will try to reach a set number of KOs first. Pretty straightforward. For Battle Royale, all players will be dropped onto the map with a single life. Last man standing wins. Both of these would probably be more hectic if I had more than two players, but what are you going to do? Finally, we have time trials, which implement a timer and computer enemies. Each player needs to shoot down as many AI small fries as they can before the timer runs out. If a player pulls ahead, you can also target them, as getting KO'd will leave them completely broke. The player with the highest kill count when the clock hits zero wins. Now, if experience differs drastically between players, the game does offer handicaps. You know, I'll have to take you up on that. There are some unlockables for the multiplayer, including the ability to fight in Landmasters or on foot. However, unlocking these requires performing extremely well in the campaign, and uh, that's not happening. Not a bad multiplayer offering, but the N64 definitely had better. And that was Star Fox 64, the crown jewel of the franchise, the title others could only aspire to be. Playing this game today, I can totally see why it's so heavily praised. It was the first Star Fox game that really had the technology to flesh out the worlds, characters, and story. The game urges you to play its campaign again and again, always promising something new. And sometimes, it's those little details that can be the most engrossing. 
When different members of my team were present, dialogue and interactions with characters would change. I admit defeat. Are you gonna listen to that monkey? When I failed to defeat Starwolf on planet Ficina, the two remaining members of the team reappeared on Bulse, a location where they usually don't appear. Your carcass is mine. What? Every action you take feels like it contributes to the story, and that is such a cool feeling. Seeing how well this title solidified Star Fox's identity, I don't blame them for trying to recapture it, but Star Fox 64's sense of wonder and exploration can't be replicated if we're following the same characters in the same worlds. Show us something new, be adventurous, just make sure that adventure sticks to the core mechanics and structure that fans expect. We're in space, the final frontier. So, let's explore. Star Fox, we are in your debt. I would be honored to have you as part of the Cornarian... Oh no, sir. We prefer doing things our own way. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Speak for yourself. Uh, do you guys cover dental?